time, let the church say amen. And for good measure, let the church say amen. I want to welcome you to worship at Crossroads Church this morning. We're continuing in a series of messages entitled Soundtrack. And we are asking the question, what does your life sound like? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Christ. We thank you so very much for the opportunity to be here today in the presence of your word. We ask that you speak clearly that we came for no other purpose than to hear from you. It is in the mighty name of Christ we pray, and for his sake we say, Amen. Stand in honor of God's word, if you would. If you're unable to stand in honor of God's word, I would pray that you would stand in your heart. We're beginning our time together with the book of James. We're going to be in chapter 4, starting at verse 8. The book of James, chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. I want to speak to you from the topic this morning, the closer I get to you. The closer I get to you. You may be seated in the presence of his word. Hey, man, I did warn you at the beginning of our, at our series that I was going to dig deep and pull on some song titles from the past and, uh, and, and to use them as examples of what we're talking about as it relates to the soundtracks of our lives. So today, James chapter 4 verse 8 led me to the thought, the closer I get to you. Now here is an uncomfortable fact. Even where there is the existence of endearing love, you love your boo and your boo loves you. Even when y'all just kissy face and you just, you're just all over one another, and you're happily married. Let me put that in there as I talk about being all over one another. Amen, somebody. And so you're in that kind of a relationship that's sanctified and glorified in Christ, and y'all just madly in love. Even in that relationship, quite frankly, it's hard to maintain. This culture makes it hard to maintain a loving relationship with another person. And one of the reasons I believe relationships struggle is because there's just simply too much competition for love. There's just too much competition. Even in your married life, when you're deeply in love, there's too much competition. So I was curious. I wondered what were the top ten relationship killers in our culture. So I did some research, of course. You know, uh, I did what I do, and I dug and found Dr. Barton Goldsmith. And according to Dr. Goldsmith, here are the top 10 relationship killers in our culture. You might want to write these down. Now, as I say them, don't turn to the left and don't turn to the right and tell somebody in the house, amen, don't do that. Just look right at your phone, look at your tablet, look at your television station. Number 10, top 10 relationship killers. Number 10, being mean. Being mean is one of the top ten relationships killer. This is being mean. You're mean because you have a desire to punish your partner for something. And the main way that I know, I don't know how the ladies do it, but I know one of the main ways that men are mean is that we, we drop that silent treatment on you. Number nine, I'm going to keep it moving. I got some place to go. Laziness. Relationships without work will diminish. There's no such thing. Can I tell you that dating is a fictitious lie? Dating is smoke and mirrors. Relationships take work. Number eight, lying or broken promises is the eighth killer of relationships. It's not that we tell an outright lie in this situation. It's more like we don't tell the whole truth. Like when you purchase something at the grocery store and you bought your own personal stuff, but you say the groceries cost 150 but 50 of that, come on, somebody. I better keep. Number seven, remodeling. What do I mean by remodeling as a relationship killer? 
when you're constantly in reconstruction mode in your relationship, you're always fixing something. Some broke, y'all fixing. You're broken, you're fixing. At some point, reconstruction or remodeling can be a relationship killer. Number six, working our way to number one. Number six is resentment. Holding in pain. Somebody has hurt you and you hold it in. It causes resentment. And so then at, at, at that point, it's a relationship killer. Resentment can be number five. Opposite sex friends. Need I say more? The fifth relationship killer in our culture is opposite sex friend. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about friends who have inappropriate boundaries. Number four. You're not going to like this one. Children. Kids create an imbalance, particularly in the blended family environment that we find ourselves in now where you meet somebody, you've got kids and they've got kids. But even if all the kids in the house are from one mom and one dad, kids create an imbalance. What do I mean by that? The time that you used to spend together with each other is fitted away. It's fitted away because the kids demand time. And if you're not careful, you'll spend so much time with the kids that when they grow up and leave, you don't even know each other anymore. Number three, top ten relationship killers, according to Dr. Barton Goldsmith. Number three is disrespect. Name calling. Belittlement. Yelling. And my favorite, the threat to leave. You know I can go someplace. I don't have to put up with this. I'll leave. Number two, <laughs> some of y'all enjoying this list a little too much. The top, the second relationship killer, wait for you know this one. We think this is number one, but it's not. Sex, or better yet, infidelity. Now, when I said sex, of course you thought about unfaithfulness as a marriage killer, a relationship killer. But can I suggest to you something else? It's not always infidelity that kills the relationship it's also a sexless marriage that can kill a relationship. I'm going to let that marinate for a little while. But the number one relationship killer of all times, I've been pastoring for a decade plus. I've been married for three decades plus, And the And, and this, this number one has not shared its spot with very many of the others on the list. Number one is, is, is wait for it, money. Money is the number one cause of divorce in our culture. And not so much a lack of money, which is a challenge, but a deceitful partner as it relates to money. Where somebody's hiding a little something, some slipping in things in the back door, putting stuff in the trunk, snatching tags off and hanging in the closet. Somebody said, amen, separate bank accounts that's got a separate bank account that's got a separate bank account. Why do I mention the top ten relationship killer? Because God is saying to you today, the closer I get to you, the better it is for both of us. And as far as God is concerned, I, if you're a believer, I'm not sure what your issue is, but if there is an issue between you and the Lord, and I don't know what that relationship issue might be, but I'm convinced that God is desperately wanting to become closer and closer to you. So I want to suggest to you today that God wants to be closer. He wants nothing more than to be closer to you. So that I brought with me three ways in which you could help God to be closer to you. Let's jump in. Because you belong to God and he wants nothing more than to be closer to you, you have to assist him in these three ways. Number one, you have got to be honest about your occasional estrangement from him. Every now and again, we go out on God. We step out on God. Let's tell the truth and shame the devil. We're good for a while, and then we get a little bored with our Lord and Savior, and we step out on him. James chapter 4, verse 8 says this, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, each of the exhortations in this particular verse is a means of entering and or re-entering into an intimate relationship with God. He says, draw near. What James is telling us here is, I need you to approach the Lord like a priest would approach the Lord as he enters the temple, as he advances toward God for the purposes of worship and for, for service. So when a minister approaches the throne of God, there is reverence, and he draws near to God with a sense of reverence. James admonishes us to draw near, and he, which his, his admonishment to draw near 
presumes that we've that we've backslided or that we've pulled away. He's not saying I need you to draw near for the first time. He says I need you to draw near again. He uses the word estrangement in a sense. Estrangement, estrangement is hostility. It's distancing. It's a breakup. It's a falling out. But the reason we pull away from God is because we have something called disaffection. Our affection toward the Lord sometimes wanes and we find ourselves pulling back from the Lord. Now, when we become estranged or when we become alienated from God, it's probably because we've given in to three separate sinful challenges. Challenge number one, when we pull back from God and we're no longer close to him, it could be because we're dealing with the sin of uncontrolled passion. And this sin of uncontrolled passion is not a sexual nature. I'm talking about relationships. You're in James chapter 4. Go back up to chapter, verse 1. The Bible says, what is the source of quarrels or prolonged, protracted fights? And what's the source of conflicts? In this case, bitter clashes. What are the source of these things among you? He says, it's not the source of your pleasures. Is is not the source your pleasures. Here he talks about sensual gratification. He said, y'all can't get along because of your sensual gratification, your need for it anyway. He says, it wars, wages war in your members. You lust and you do not have and you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you don't ask. You ask, but you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasure. James is saying to us here, not only are we fighting amongst ourselves, but we're making plans and we're preparing weapons and we're even offering up prayers in order to attack our rivals in the family of God. We're asking least in the presence of God, asking God, I hope you get her. I hope you get him. And we're not talking about the world in instances. In this context, it was Christians arguing with Christians. Now, I, but, I thought, but I thought you were talking about, Pastor, me drawing close to God. Can I suggest something to you? The closer you are to your brother and sister in Christ, the closer you are to God. Mm. See, you alienate lo the Lord when you alienate the, your brothers and sisters in Christ. The second way that we are estranged from God, not only the, does the sin of uncontrolled passion pull us away from God, but the, also the sin of unshielded principles draws us away from God. This is referred to as the world's magnetism. Drop down the verse 4, James chapter 4. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, James uses an interesting word here. He says, adulteress, adulteresses, because here the Holy Spirit's reminding us that we as Christians, we are the wife of Christ, the woman of Christ. As Christians, we are better known as the bride of Christ. And it's been because of the bride of Christ, anyone who, come on, accepts the spirit or the standard of the world is in fact acting like an adulteress, like an unfaithful wife. And one reason the church is paralyzed in this season and powerless in many quarters today is because in a way we've become unfaithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and that causes him to postpone revival and it also causes him to withhold blessings. So then the way to revival is not to, not to draw near to the world, but to be, once again to begin to draw near to Christ. We see that we become alienated from God because of the sin of uncontrolled passion and the sin of unguarded principles. But thirdly, the thing that draws us away from God is the sin of unbroken pride. Go down to verse 6 of James chapter 4. He says, therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The word opposition here literally means to align an army in a battle formation. He's saying once you become prideful, God has to align an army figuratively in a battle formation to block you. Now, right out the gate, James says, we will, we will every now and then, we'll find ourselves on the wrong side of our relationship with God. But here's the good news. But because he loves you, he comes to get you. He always makes room for grace. That's a moment for shouting right there. Even when we aren't drawing near to God, God's like, God's like a two-year-old child that wants something to drink. They are not going to let you go until you bless them. 
Mama, I'm thirsty. Mama, I'm thirsty. I want something to drink. I want something to drink. And God says, even when you're walking away from me, just turn your head to the left or to the right over your shoulder, and I'm right behind you saying, come back. What are we doing? Right out the gate. God shows, watch this, favor to those who humble themselves. This is important. God is always ready to accept those who accept him. This is good news for me for those seasons when I decide I'm going to step out on God, even if it's for a moment, even if it's for a day, even if it's for an hour, even if it's for the summer. God's saying to me, listen, my grace is sufficient. Won't you come on home? So we've seen this morning, because you belong to God, he wants nothing more than to get closer to you. To, and to assist him, you must first be honest about your occasional estrangement from him. Go ahead and say, you know what, there are seasons in my life where I decide I'll be back, God. Secondly, in order to get back to God, to become closer to him, for him to come closer to you, you can assist him in this way. you got to be prepared to satisfy your spiritual indebtedness to him. Not only must you be honest about your occasional need to, to, to step out, but you also got to be honest about, I need to get back in his good graces in a sense. I owe him an, a spiritual debt, and I need to go ahead and take care of that. So James gives us, I believe, what is a how-to manual for repentance. Let's just say that something has pricked your heart this morning. And you said, you know what? I do need to get back close. I do need to make my way back to God. I do need to draw closer to God again. Whether sinner or saint, we must come to God on his terms alone and assume our spiritual obligations to him as laid out in the word. And James is gracious enough to show us how to do that. Step one, he gives us a how-to manual. Step number one, James says, if you want to find your way back to God, you need to join the resistance. Join the resistance. Drop down to verse 7, James chapter 4. He says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Look at that. He said, you got you to gotta join the resistance. Truth is, there is only one reason we find ourselves away from God, and it's because we fall and pray to the enemy's seductions and entitle, enticements. Do you remember Adam and Eve and how they were doing fine? Come on, somebody. Nobody had a better setup as it relates to the relationship with God more than Adam and Eve. Nobody. However, even in paradise, the enemy enticed them. Can I say we're not living in paradise, so you need to watch out. He will try to entice you in this season where we're offline. How does he do it? He's the master, the enemy, Satan is, of gently holding our hands and convincing us that not only is it more profitable to walk with him instead of God, it's certainly more pleasurable to walk with him instead of God. He says, listen, bruh, God's boring, bruh. Hang with me, and man, we're going to light it up. It's more fun to hang with me. So, so then James says, don't believe the lies. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. How do you fight back? How exactly do you fight back? James gives us insight. He says the first thing you do as you're joining the resistance is to submit to God. Submit is a military term here. It's, an Ill, it's, it's akin to military enlistment at a recruiting statement, a recruiting station. It means to willingly place yourself under the authority of someone else as, 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 as seen in how someone will go to a military installment and say, I sign on, I want to be a Marine. I want to be an Air Force member. And so you'll sign up and you then say, I give my mind, body, and spirit to you to teach me, to break me, to make me a soldier. James is saying we need to do that thing in submitting to God. He goes on to say, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Resistance here means to take a stand, to actively oppose his pressure, to actively contest his power. This is true of every believer. We are not confused about those moments when the enemy is trying to get at us. We are all fully aware of what happens when the enemy's trying to get at us. And you know the moment when you're saying, uh-oh, decision time. And so James is saying, I need you to act actively resist and contest his power. Here's how you do it. You claim the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I'll claim it in a minute by the blood of Christ. Amen. Satan, you have no place 
in this relationship. Come on, somebody. You actively claim the word of Christ. You speak the truth through the word of God to your situation. And you actively claim the spirit of Christ. You enlist the help of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, you actively claim the name of Christ. Notice what I said. You attack him with Christ. You attack him with Christ. And after you attack him with Christ, you attack him with Christ again. So the enemy cannot withstand. James says if you resist him, he'll flee. So then he is not as he is not as powerful as we give him credit for. He can't handle resistance. But we make it easy if we don't resist. Step two, not only should you join the resistance, James also tells us that we need to own our mess. Verse eight, James chapter four, draw near to God as a priest, as I told you earlier, approaches him for ministry and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom and humble yourselves in the presence of God and he will exalt you. I know somebody saying, job, pass. That's a rough passage. But remember what we're after today, saints of God. We're trying to get back to God. Amen. We have willingly walked away and the Lord said, I want you back. If I, if I can use the Jackson 5 title, I want you back back. And so then in order to make that happen, James says, something's got to break in you. Oh, that's good for me. What is he talking about? He says, cleanse your hands. We're familiar with that. All we've been doing is making lotion companies and soap companies rich these last few months because everybody's cleansing their hands. God says, cleanse your hands. He's talking about, I need you to be free from ritual contamination. See, sin causes spiritual uncleanliness. Your outward and your inward sin has got to be rejected, got to be renounced, got to be relinquished. Pure repentance involves bathing before God. So when you walk in the presence of God, you need to wash up first. Amen, somebody. It's like when your mama tells you, you come outside, anybody remember this, to eat dinner. And you come outside and you've been playing out. Well, that's back in the day when it used to go outside. I don't know. Hallelujah. Nobody goes outside anymore. Before pandemic, children didn't see sunlight. But that's another message. Remember back in the day, some of us, when you came inside to get something to eat and you made that right turn, that left turn toward the kitchen, what'd your mama say? Oh, no, 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 no. What? Do what? Go wash your hands. Listen to me. When you approach God after having been gone for a little while, James says, I need you to cleanse yourself. Amen. He goes on to tell us how to do that. He says, I need you to be miserable and to mourn. He says, I need you to grind. Watch this. This, this, this phrase, be miserable but mourn, literally means to grind the powder. This is a reference to the, to, the, to the cornmeal offering. It wasn't called a cornmeal offering, but hey man, it is what it is. It's called a meal offering. It was really known as the peace offering, and it was literally ground up corn that you would give to God. And so he's saying be miserable and mourn. He says there got to be a sense of brokenness as you come back to God. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. If you want to be closer to him, you have to have a sense of brokenness. He also goes on to say you need to humble yourself in his presence. Humbleness is not just a one-time situation. It's a disposition. It's a discipline. He also says, I need you to exalt yourself. See, the enemy, I'm sorry, I don't need you to exalt yourself. Once you watch this, cleanse your hands, be miserable and mourn, Humble yourselves in his presence. Then he says, then he will exalt you. See, this is good stuff. The enemy, watch this, offers immediate gratification. That's his hook. He says, if you do this now, you'll feel good right now. If you say that now, you'll feel good right now. He's, he's an instant grits man. He's an instant oatmeal man. Amen, somebody. He wants you to have it right away. He's an ATM Press the buttons, you got to put some money in it first. You press the buttons, and instantly you have money in your hand. But God, however, is not interested in your interesting, your immediate gratification. God is interested in your immediate reward. Stay with me. He says, I want to reward you. I don't want to gratify you. I want to lift you up. The word exaltation here means to heighten or to elevate, to raise up, to lift up. Believers in every circumstance, listen to me carefully, every circumstance of your life, if you own your mess, God will lift you out of your mess. 
If you own your mess, God will lift you out of your mess. It's a beautiful thing. We've seen so far this morning that because you belong to God, he wants nothing more than to get closer to you. And how do we assist him? First, we we must be prepared to concede our spiritual um, estrangement from him. We must be prepared to fulfill our spiritual indebtedness to him. And lastly, this morning, you must be prepared to receive your spiritual restoration through him. Can I say this as succinctly as I can? You can't make yourself right with God again by, by, by performing a checklist. Only God could make you right with him again. And James tells us what it looks like. Drop down to, to verse 5 of James chapter 4. Or do you think that the scripture speaks of no purpose? Look at this. He jealously desires the spirit, which he is made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. This is one of the most difficult passages to interpret. Theologians argue over what this means. I'm going to take my stab at it this morning. I want, I want you to understand something, though. You, you can't make any mistake. Make no mistake about it. God wants you to know that spiritual restoration is available to any one of us who would come to him by way of the cross. If you come back toward God by way of the cross, spiritual restoration is waiting on you. Amen. The closer you get to God, the more you're going to need his spiritual restoration. Let's take a look. James says that we should praise God for his spiritual preparation, his spiritual restoration. And how do we obtain it? He says, first of all, it's, a, it's, it's, first of all, it's assured to us by the scriptures. Then he's going to show us it's secured to us by the spirit. And lastly, it's procured by the Savior. Let's take a look. It's assured to us by the scriptures. James 4, 5a says, do you not think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? Just like God himself, the scriptures never tell a lie. The word of God is going to search for and expose sin in and, and, and the same way that God searches for and exposes sin. And also, the word of God has, watch this, promises of forgiveness and cleansing. Oh, get in on this. God's word has promises of forgiveness and cleansing. God's word promises you forgiveness and cleansing. James has said, quit tripping, trying to ignore it trying to act like you're all good with God when you know you're not. You're missing out on opportunity to be clean, to be cleansed and forgive. Galatians chapter 8, chapter 3, verse 8 says, The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saving, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. The scripture tells us that God's plan, God's plan all along has been for our spiritual restoration. God's singing to himself, the closer I get to you. God wants you to be really close to him, and he wants to be really close to you. So he tells us that the scriptures assure us of his closeness. He goes on to tell us that the, that we're, that the spirit assures us of being close to him again. Verse 5 again. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit with which he has made to dwell in us. Now, again, this is indeed a difficult verse to unpack. Dr. Stephen Olford, one of the most powerful ministers of God I've ever seen, puts it this way in a paraphrase. Dr. Olford says this, and I quote, this is how he says this verse in his mind reads, quote, the Holy Spirit who indwells us yearns with a holy jealousy to bring us back to God. The Spirit of God is feeling some kind of way when you walk away from God. It grieves him when you walk away from God. The Spirit of God is saying, please, can we just go home? It's just like the Apostle Paul longed for, with a godly jealousy, the presentation of the gospel to the church in Corinth. He, his heart was burning that Corinth would get right. So it is with the Holy Spirit who desires nothing less than that we should be, watch this, untainted by sin and that we walk in the high road of holiness. Not only does the scripture says you can get back to God, not only does the spirit promise that we can get back to God, lastly, we have a savior who makes sure that we can get back to God. James says in verse six, but he gives a greater peace. In his first appearing, the Lord Jesus Christ gave grace 
of salvation. And now he gives us the grace of restoration. Don't miss that. Initially, he gave us the grace of salvation. And so now we're saved. But now, every now and again, we tend to need something called the grace of restoration. Closer to God. Bring, being brought back to God. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. There are people who will throw you away at the slightest indiscretion. You make one mistake and you're out. Deuces, holla, peace. I'll get back with you. Matter of fact, I won't get back with you. Praise be to God that he loves you enough that he'll not only will he, not only will he get back with you, he'll come and get you out of your mess. I wish I had a witness here. My goodness. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where sin abounded, grace, this is a shouting moment, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Do you get it? Can you manufacture it in your head, even in your brokenness, even in your foolishness? The most foolish you've ever been is not more powerful than God's grace. Amen, somebody. The, mo the worst idiotic thing you've ever said is not, watch this, strong enough to dissipate the grace of God. I wish I got, I, I wish you'd understand this. The times you've walked away, umpteen times, are not strong enough to dissipate the grace of God. God's grace is available, it's sustainable, and it's amazing. There is no life too smudged, too tainted, too defaced by sin that the heavenly artist himself cannot restore it back to its original beauty. Oh, I wish I had a witness in his house. God wants to restore you back to your original beauty. Some of y'all use Botox and 18 different creams trying to get back to come on somebody to your original beauty. Some of y'all are using, uh, what is this called? Uh, gray for men. I don't know y'all forget the name of it, Rodney, but amen. I, I used to used to love gray for men uh, and put that on my beard and try to roll back the hands of time, but something would happen. Some of y'all are using Miss Clairol, but nothing can restore you back to your original beauty except the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to end where I began this morning with the top 10 relationship killers. Do you remember them? Number 10 was being mean. Number nine was laziness. Number eight was lying. Number seven was remodeling. Number six was resentment. Number five was opp opposite sex relationships. Number four were children. Number three was disrespect. Number two was sex. Number one was money. Why do I mention that list again as we conclude today? I want you to understand something, that as it relates to your relationship with God, this list doesn't really matter. Amen. God wants you in spite of all the ways that you've walked away from him. James puts it this way. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. God is simply saying this morning, I want you back, and the closer I get to you, the better it is for you and for me. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Christ, and we thank you so very much for the opportunity to remind those of us that you want nothing, those of us who've walked away, that you want nothing more than restoration. I know the enemy said, nope, that doesn't apply to you. Nope, you, you've been out there too long. Nope, pastor doesn't know what you've done. Nope. I want to tell you something. He's a lie. He's a liar from the beginning. He's a liar in the middle, and he'll be a liar to the end. God's grace is amazing. And James says, if you draw near to God, come on, somebody, God will draw near to you. It's a promise. It's not a maybe. It's an absolute promise. God says, if you walk toward me, I'll walk toward, I wish I had a witness here. I remember the story of the prodigal son who went away and did what he wanted to do on his own terms, took his inheritance and went away. <laughs> but one day, his father saw him raggedy, broken, bruised, battered, limping his way back toward the house. And because he'd wronged his father, his father could have easily said, listen, listen, little boy, I'm just going to fold my arms and I'm, so you came back. Look at you. You're a hot mess. 
and, and, and your life is a mess. And where's the rest of my money that I gave you? Spent it all, I bet. He didn't do that. When he thought he saw, come on, somebody, his son down the road, when he turned his head and said, is that my boy coming back? And the moment he could make out the, the small details of a face that he brought into the world, the Bible says he jacked up his garment. Come on, somebody. His robe was at his knees. You better get in on this. And he ran toward his son. God, the moment God sees you making your way back to him, he's going to jack up his garment and you'll get a chance to see his knees and he's going to run back toward you. Don't allow the enemy to let you live a lie that you can't find your way back. God is singing to the, the closer I get to you. God saying, I need you. I want you back. And I'm not going to wait for you to make it all the way back. The moment I see you, I'm going to run toward you. The word of God is speaking to you today. Who are you? In what state of prodigal are you? God saying, the closer I get to you, the better it is for you. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to come on back to the Lord. And I want to extend that if I can. If you know the Lord and the free pardon of your sin, but you've been away for a little while, come on. I want you to take James's advice and draw near to God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so very much for an opportunity to return to you. I ask you that you forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Enable me to be close to you again. Enable me to cleanse myself and to own my mess and to receive the grace that the scripture says is mine. To receive the grace that the spirit says is mine. To receive the grace that the Savior says is mine. In the name of Jesus, I pray this prayer. And for his sake, I say, amen, amen, and amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I want you to log on to Crossroads website. Go on our contact form portion of our page and said I gave my life to Christ or if you're one of those who decided to return to God and you're I want you to say you know what I, I, I made my way back to the Lord I we'd love to celebrate with you and see and then uh, partner with you as God continues to move in your life well we will see you next week as we continue the series entitled <laughs> soundtrack what your life look like and so it's funny we'll be talking about next week from the title I will survive. So I want to give a shout out. I've been doing this here. I want to give a shout out. I've been out of the country a little bit with our shout outs at the end of the messages saying thank you. But I want to come back to the United States. I want to give a shout out to Florida for the folks who are listening to us from Florida. And I got to give a special shout out to my guy CJ and my girl Olivia. Amen. If you're watching Pop Pop on the screen, amen. Pop Pop, love you, need you, and want you. And I give you an air hug. They're not the only folks listening in Florida, but I got to admit, they're real close to me. These are my people. Amen. I want to thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to, to log on to Crossroads Church. I would love if you would share our broadcast, if you would like our broadcast, and then after you like it, you shared it again, and after you shared it, you'd like it again. We'd love for Crossroads Church to expound our, board, our, our, board, our boundaries even further than they already are. So we thank you and we praise you. Here's what I want for you. I want you to be safe. I need you to put on your mask. I need you to wash your hands and keep your distance six feet. This too shall pass, but we have to be wise and smart. I need you to be strong. Hang in there emotionally. Hang in there relationally. Hang in there spiritually. Be safe. Be strong. And here's what I know about what God's going to do for you this week. You are going to be blessed. I thank you and I praise the Lord for you. In Christ's name, have a great week. We love you. Have a good week. Peace.